Welcome back. Question period is on after a two-week hiatus. I'm sure you all missed this daily get-together. I know I did. <laughs> Seriously, they're back for a week, then they're off again. So let's hope we get some good questions. And before we start, I know you guys really don't want to hear the statements, the SO31s by the members. So I wanted to recap some of the material I was doing on the weekend. It's very exciting because nobody else has been doing it. And I hope you were watching the broadcast. But if you were missed, if you have missed it all, let me fill you in. An interview from last Friday with Radio Canada, the French CBC, Justin Trudeau basically made a fool of himself. And he said he thinks daily, every day, about leaving this crazy job as prime minister. And, but he says, you know, it's so hard to be a prime minister. And he also went on and on and on about the fact that he has to persevere because there's just nobody out there like him. But here's the real bone of contention. In the original BBC story from the Radio Canada interview, Trudeau was quoted as saying, I think about quitting every day. It's a crazy job. I'm doing, I'm, Doing, making the personal sacrifices. The crazy job I'm doing, making the personal sacrifices. Excuse me. It's super boring at times. Now, there is a bit of pushback. And I'm going to go into who pushed back. Was it the prime minister's office? Was it Justin Trudeau? Or was it just some ex post by a well-known Toronto Star columnist who shall be re re rename, remain nameless at this point? I don't know. But somehow the story changed. No longer was Justin Trudeau saying that it was super boring. No, he was, he was now saying, now get this here, here. He was now saying that, okay, he says super, where's the original article? He says super boring. Here's the one the following day. Here, see the change here, circled in red. It went from, Sometimes it's super boring, To It's very challenging at times. But if you look at the interview from Radio Canada, the French transcript, he says super plat. That's the word that is in the, the French CBC art, uh, interview. That's how they quote him. Super plat. I mean, that's franglais to begin with, mixture of French and English. But it means super boring. It's super flat or super boring. Where they got challenging out of this, I don't know. But this is so indicative of what Justin Trudeau is. Anyway, Pierre Polyev didn't miss this story. He was in Fredericton Saturday night at an Axe the Tax rally. Very exciting. And here's what he had to say about this. Let's, let's have a listen. Canadians are not the only ones suffering. Justin Trudeau has it very tough. Do you hear about this? He, he, he's a little bit bored. Do you hear about this? Incredible, this quote. I got to read these quotes here for day. He said this in French in an interview with Rad Ken. He said, I think about quitting every day. Oh, isn't that funny? We think about firing him every day. It's a crazy job making the personal sacrifices. Yeah, right, like flying off to Billionaire Island, <laughs> burning thousands and thousands of liters of jet fuel at our expense into the atmosphere, and in these 80, 90, 100,000 dollar vacations he takes. Sounds like a terrible personal sacrifice. Uh, and I'm quoting here, of course, it's super tough. It's super boring at times. Wow. Things, the job is boring. Blaine, you don't find your job boring, do you? You know, you find it to be a very invigorating job because serving the people is not boring. Serving the people is what we do. Yeah, serving the people is what we do right on here. I hope there's an exchange today between Pierre Polyev and Justin Trudeau on this issue. Because I don't know if Justin Trudeau is going to be in the house today. Mondays are a bad day for Justin to begin with. He usually doesn't meander in until Tuesday, Wednesday. But I hope this issue is raised in the House of Commons because 
my God, they've been away for two weeks. Justin Trudeau just gets away with murder. I'm not literal. No, I better watch what I say. No, he gets away with saying incredibly stupid, inane, insipid things, especially when he's speaking in French because he thinks nobody really is listening. He says things that he will not say, he would not say in English. He says them in French. So it's always good to listen to these interviews that he does. And this was certainly a fine example of that. I believe he did say the job is super boring because what is exciting for Justin Trudeau? Superheroes, science fiction, the, the things that turn on a teenager. And that's what turns on Justin Trudeau. Work is not exciting for Justin Trudeau. All he wants to do is flag his favorite causes, his favorite issues, climate change, LGBTQ, euthanasia, Ukraine now, economic catastrophe. That, those are his five favorite issues. And that's all he wants to talk about. So this is fascinating. I think we need to keep on him about this. And we need to keep on him on the online harms bill this week, on a rive scam, and on the Chinese interference. Remember that? The spying scandal? He walked away from that two weeks ago, and he's hoping nobody talks about it again. He re because he doesn't want to talk about Chinese interference, because I believe he fully anticipated Chinese interference in that last election. But he does not want this issue being raised in the House. He, doesn't, he does not want the committee, the ethics committee, talking about it. He just wants this to go away. And believe me, he will want these comments from Radio Canada to go away. And if he's in the House today, he won't be there for long. So we're going to go to the question period now. Just about time to start the real questions. Yeah, yeah, real questions. And I will be commenting throughout and making my usual witty and insightful analysis. I hope you missed this weekly session. I did, and I'll be here all week. So I'll be uh, I'll be back in a minute to add some color to this event. When will they listen to the single mother who has had to choose between heating or eating for her family and the senior who lays awake worrying about how they're going to manage yet another tax hike while on their fixed incomes? When will they listen to rural Canadians who have no options for heating their homes or trans transportation? When will this government finally start to hear the cries of Canadians who want to ax the tax and hike this spike in the tax? <laughs> The Honourable Member for Bourassa. Mr. Speaker, this year once again, thanks to International Women's Day, I had the opportunity to honour eight exceptional female citizens who are contributing to the quality of life in Bourassa. I'd like to thank all of the elected officials who joined me in order to celebrate these women who have done a great deal in our riding. Mr. Speaker, women's struggle is our struggle. For the seventh edition, I was pleased to give medals to weight women in Bourassa, Elena Adipietro, Julie Besset, Julie Mayer, René Dagené, Huguette Peloquin, Keisha Estimé, Yves Torres, and Sly Toussaint. I'd like to congratulate all of them. Thank you. The Honourable Member from Hamilton Centre. Today I will read into the record what legal expert Dr. Artie Amesis has to say on the legal framework for Palestinian statehood. Palestine is recognized by 140 states. Palestine is a judicial fact. Its territory is under illegal foreign military occupation by Israel, but that does not mean the state of Palestine does not exist in law. It possesses all four of the criterion for statehood as codified the 1933 Montevito Convention on the Rights and Duties of States. 
It has a permanent population, a territory, a government, and the capacity to enter into foreign relations with other states. Successive Israeli governments have for years indicated that they will never allow the establishment of an independent Palestinian state and that only Jewish people have the right to jurisdiction, uh, self-determination in the land between the river and the sea. This is unlawful. As a preemptory norm, no people has uh, right to self-determination in their own territory can be subject to negotiation under international law. This is Canada's last chance for the only uh, framework for a two-state solution. Where will this Liberal government stand today on Palestinian statehood? The Honourable Member for Abitibi Bay James Menevikiou. Mr. Speaker, on behalf of the Bloc Québécois, Yeah, I can see some of these comments here. Very interesting. Uh, NATO signing an agreement last week to accept help from Chinese police. Dig deep. Okay, Marnie, uh, that's the first I've heard of this. That shouldn't surprise anybody, but no, that's the first I've heard. I will have a look at that. Uh, I don't know what who effing cares means or why what that refers to. But please try to keep your language civil. Good afternoon, Sandy. Good afternoon, everybody. Yes, we're back for the big event of the day. So thanks for joining us. And I promise I'll shut up as soon as the uh, questions start here, but which should be momentarily. No, they're, they're still going. Anyway. The Prime Minister is going to play a cruel joke on Canadians on April 1st, hiking the carbon tax again, this time by 23%, as part of his plans with the NDP to a quadruple the carbon tax on everyone. That's why 70% of Canadians and seven premiers are demanding a stop to this latest tax hike. Even the provincial Liberals now in Ontario and New Brunswick are getting out against these never-ending tax hikes. After eight years, Mr. Speaker, even Liberals now know that this Prime Minister is just not worth the cost. The only ones that don't seem to get it are the NDP Liberal Coalition here in Ottawa. But meanwhile, it is getting worse as food banks are bracing for an extra one million visits to food banks this year. Our common sense plan is clear. Axe the tax for everyone, everywhere, for good. It's time the Prime Minister, the NDP and the Liberals smartened up, spiked the hike and axe the tax. The Honourable Member from Labrador. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It is with deep sadness that I raise, rise today to pay tribute to a remarkable woman, politician, entrepreneur, and friend. Former MP Kim Rudd, who represented the riding of Northumberland, Peterborough South from 2015 to 2019, recently passed away after a long battle with cancer. Kim worked hard for her constituency and for Canadians. She served as a parliamentary secretary, chair of the Health Research Caucus, and on a number of committees. She was a strong supporter of women and of the mining industry and the nuclear industry, knowing that the resource sector was key to climate action. Kim was a fierce fighter in her battle with cancer and used her experience to advocate for new research in ovarian cancer and for women's health. But most importantly, Kim was a wife, a mother, and a grandmother, a loyal and beautiful friend who will be deeply missed. Her hard work and commitment lit the way for others and left this world a better place. Let's carry that torch for Kim in her fight for women and for all Canadians. Today, we send our deepest sympathies to her husband, Tom, her daughters, Allison and Stephanie, their partners and her four grandchildren, and we thank Kim for her contributions to our country. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. There we go. The Honorable Leader of the Official Opposition. After eight years of this Prime Minister, he's not worth the cost. Common sense conservatives are working to fix the budget, stop crime and build homes. But the prime minister, 
not only wants to impose a new 17 cents a liter tax on gas with the support of the NDP and the bloc, he now wants to impose a decree to close the forestry sector in Quebec. Why does the prime minister want to uh, step on Quebec's jurisdiction to kill jobs in the forestry sector? The honor of the deputy question, prime minister and minister of finance, Mr. Speaker, since 2013, Quebec has put in place its own uh, process uh, and for uh, putting a price on carbon. The province is not under the federal regime. The conservative leader continues to show to what extent he doesn't understand Quebecers by promising to demolish a system that Quebec decided to put in place itself over 10 years ago. That's the, it's the conservative leader who does not respect provincial jurisdiction. Well, we're going to have to put up with dictator number two. Apparently there was a, uh, an interpretation error. The prob question was about the forestry sector, Mr. Speaker, that the prime minister wants to close with a decree which violates Quebec's jurisdiction. Meanwhile, common sense Conservatives want to defend workers in the forestry sector. Meanwhile, in the Journal de Montreal, we read that these people are hungry. People have had to, uh, the police have had to uh, intervene twice in distributing food uh, baskets. So why is the prime minister with his tax and inflationary deficits continuing to make people hungry? The Honorable Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, the Conservatives are the ones who want to reduce all of the social supports that the federal government now offers to Quebecers. The only thing that the Conservatives understand how to do is cut, cut, cut. They want to cut support for those less fortunate, but we will be there and we will not let the Conservatives uh, cut this necessary aid. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. While common sense Conservatives are fighting to axe the tax, build the homes, fix the budget and stop the crime, this Prime Minister is promising a cruel April Fool's Day joke, a 23% carbon tax hike on food, gas and groceries. This at a time when the Prime Minister has forced 50 families in at CFB at Gagetown, military families to go to food banks, 2 million Canadians every month going to those same food banks, 8,000 as part of a Facebook group where they share tips on eating out of dumpsters. Will the Prime Minister gain some compassion and some common sense and spike the hike? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, we will take no lessons from the Conservatives when it comes to supporting the least vulnerable in our country. This is the party that wants to cut the Canada Child Benefit. This is the party that wants to cut support to our seniors. This is the party that wants to cut early learning and child care, which supports so many families. They're opposed to dental care. They're opposed to pharmacare, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Fear and falsehoods to distract from the fact that after eight years of this Prime Minister, he's not worth the cost, and neither is his carbon tax, which will cost the average Ontario family this coming year $1,674. $1,674 for a middle-class family that's lined up at a food bank, not able to feed themselves or pay their heating bill. Will the Prime Minister give his head a shake, cancel his cruel April Fool's Day joke, and spike the hike? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, no one here is surprised to hear the Conservative leader talk about fear and falsehoods because that is what he traffics in every yes. single day. It's his area of personal expertise. Now, what he is proposing is at least he is consistent. He wants to cut, cut, cut the support that Canadians get, and he wants to cut the support Canadian families are getting from the price on pollution. That's 1800 bucks Alberta families won't get. That's 1120 bucks Ontario families won't get. Cut, cut, cut. All they know how to do. Excellent. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. So he, she, she just brags that Alberta families will get $1,800, but according to the parliamentary budget officer, 
the carbon tax will cost Alberta families $2,943. Amazing. Amazing. So she take the prime minister takes away $2,943 and gives back $1,800. Madam uh, Mr. Speaker, it's almost like he's a bank robber who thinks that he's virtuous because he tips the teller on the way out the door. Why would he spike the hike? That's good. That's a good analogy because they're, they're constantly the liberals lie about this rebate all the time. Mr. Speaker, the conservative leader should know a lot about living off the public purse. That's all he has done his entire oh, life. Oh, get real. And when it comes to the price on pollution, this is entirely revenue neutral. The government does not keep a penny. It returns more money to eight out of ten Canadian families. That's a good deal for Canadians, Mr. Speaker. What a obnoxious woman. The Honourable Member for La Prairie. This Prime Minister... Uh, sorry, I'll interrupt the member from La Prairie, but his microphone uh, wasn't on. So I will ask the honorable member from La Prairie to restart from the beginning, please. On Friday, the Premier of Quebec met with this Prime Minister to ask for full power for Quebec when it comes to immigration. And this Prime Minister said, no, but that's not all. Did the Prime Minister commit to adjusting immigration levels to meet the ability to welcome people? No. Did he commit to doing his fair part to helping with asylum seekers? No. Did he commit to accelerating the processing of requests and the granting of work permits? No. All day he said, no, 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 no. If he doesn't want to deal with immigration, why is he preventing Quebec from doing it? The Honourable Minister of Immigration, Citizenship and Refugees. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. There is no uh, country in the world, no federal state in the world, which would give all immigration powers to a federated state. We have a major agreement with uh, Quebec that's in place, the Canada-Quebec Agreement, which gives a great deal of power to Quebec. There's responsibility on both sides, Canada and Quebec. We will continue our great relationship with Quebec and continue to work, uh, uh, particularly on the temporary workers file. The Honourable Member for La Prairie. Nobody has ever taught this prime minister that he could say yes, that he could be a partner, that he has the responsibility to bring solutions and compromises to meetings on immigration. And yet, uh, there's no additional power for Quebec, no money for asylum seekers, no help with welcoming, no accelerating work permits or processing of requests, not even any thoughts, any ideas on the ability to welcome people? And, you know, the Prime Minister said that he found his uh, job difficult and uh, maybe boring on the weekend. Is that why? Finally, he's not somebody doing it? mentioned it. The Honorable Minister of Immigration. I wonder what $5.2 billion means for the member across the way. Since 2015, our government under uh, the Canada-Quebec agreement has contributed that. It's a good uh, relationship we have. There was a good meeting on Friday. The member across the way refuses to admit it. There's work that we can continue to do with both governments, uh, and we will continue to do that. from Burnaby South. The people of Gaza are facing unspeakable violence. Thousands of children have been killed, and vital supplies like food, medicine, and water are scarce. Today, the NDP is calling on the government to do everything in its power to stop the violence and release the hostages. Will the Prime Minister vote today for peace? The Honourable Minister for Foreign Affairs. Mr. Speaker, I agree with my Honourable colleague. The violence must stop. Hostages must be released. Humanitarian <laughs> aid must go into Gaza. We need to make sure that Israeli and Palestinian civilians are protected. And that is the position of the government. We will be there to make sure that there is long-term peace in the region. And of course, to make sure that there is, uh, to make sure that the Jewish community and the Muslim community and all communities across the country are well secured and can live 
peacefully here as well. Talk oh, about being yeah. out of your depth. You gotta have the honorable member totally for Burnaby back South. Back Canadians totally are back watching, response. and they're gonna see how this government votes. La violence qu'on voit en Belgique. The violence that we're seeing in Palestine and Gaza is cannot continue. Civilians are being killed for crimes they did not commit. Our motion calls for actions that the Liberals can take to promote peace and justice in the region. Will the Prime Minister vote for peace? Yes or no? And it will be interesting to see how the affairs. government votes on this. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Our position is clear. The hostages must be released. Humanitarian hell? aid, what more position? humanitarian aid must get into Gaza, oh. and we need to ah. make sure that there is peace and stability in the region. And that is why I was in the region recently, last week. That's why the government of Canada, the country, Canada, we will continue to be there uh, to work towards all solutions, oh, it's which pathetic. will include it's just a two-state solution and recognition of a Palestinian state. You can't state, even put a also thought together. the normalization of diplomatic relations with the region. The Honourable Member from Regina Capel. After eight years, this Prime Minister is not worth the cost. And thanks to his policies, millions of Canadians are visiting a food bank for the first time in their lives. And as if prices weren't high enough already, this Prime Minister is planning a 23% hike on the carbon tax in a cruel April Fool's Day joke. But but the tax revolt is happening. 70% of Canadians and 70% of premiers are opposed and fighting back. Like in Saskatchewan, where the budget watchdog has determined that Saskatchewan families will pay an extra $2,620 in the carbon tax. So simple question, where are Saskatchewan families supposed to come up with $2,600 to pay his tax? Yeah. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance. <sighs> Mr. Speaker, I have a Mr. lot of respect Speaker. for the former Conservative leader, and he is a proud MP from the province of Saskatchewan, a province that is proud of its Ukrainian Canadian population. Oh, Gary, now, she's going to get Ukraine week, into this. The current Conservative leader said in a radio interview, he implied strongly he would cut all economic aid for Ukraine. Good. This is a chance right for on. people from Saskatchewan to say... Don't want to support your support Nazi units in Ukraine, yes, Christy, no. Yes, no. So proud her grandfather was a Nazi the propagandist. From Regina Capel. They desperately don't want to answer for the carbon tax pain they're causing Canadians. And no one is fooled by the ridiculous rebate ruse this government is selling. That's because Canadians know that the carbon tax was, <laughs> rebate was specifically designed to exclude all the secondary costs that go up when the producer, the shipper, and the retailer all have to pay their higher share of carbon taxes. And the average income earners, the middle income earners across Canada are worse off even after the rebate. $900 worse off in Alberta, $500 worse off in, Sask in Saskatchewan, $600 worse off in Ontario. Why doesn't the Prime Minister show some compassion and spike the hike? Yeah. Oh, she'll bring this back to no, Ukraine no, no, again so she Prime can... Minister and Minister More money for my Ukrainian Nazis. Mr. Speaker, I'm glad to hear the member opposite talk about the rebate because that is what it is. This is returning money to Canadians. Eight out of ten it's families so are better obvious. off. It is revenue neutral it's for the just government. So obvious. But I noticed that this Saskatchewan MP, a member of Parliament, many of us on this side of the House really respect someone who is proud to represent the people of Saskatchewan. I'd like to hear him say, does he support his leader? You can't handle the truth. Ukraine? Yes or no? The people of Saskatchewan deserve to know. The Honourable Member from Thornhill. Mr. Speaker, after eight years of this NDP Liberal Prime Minister, food bank usage in Toronto is up 500%. Now they want to hike the carbon tax on gas, on groceries, on home heating by 23% on their way to quadrupling the tax over the next six years. What a cruel April Fool's joke. According to the Parliamentary Budget Officer, the average Canadian, the average Ontario family will pay $1,674 of carbon tax. Where does this Prime Minister think they're going to get that kind of money? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the Just keep printing it, Melissa. You know that. Mr. Speaker, <laughs> 
Canadians can see through these conservatives and they know that the only thing these conservatives know how to do is cut, cut, cut. And the people who suffer the most are the most vulnerable. They want to cut the Canada child benefit. They do not support dental care, which is helping the most vulnerable among us. They do not support early learning and child care, which is helping make life more affordable for Canadian families. They are going to push, they want to push Canadians into poverty. We won't let them. You are pushing Canadians into poverty. A member from Thornhill. Mr. Speaker, they've hypocrite. already done that and we're going to cut the taxes. If you give back $1,000 to an Ontario family, but you take $1,674, liberal math says that's more, but real math says that's less. The Prime Minister doesn't get it. He's not worth the cost, especially for the 300,000 Torontonians who ate in a food bank just last February. They are about to hike taxes by 23% in less than two weeks. Why is she the only person in Canada who thinks that raising taxes will lower the cost of food? The Honourable Minister of Finance and Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker. If the member opposite really believes her rhetoric about supporting Canadian families, why does she think that cutting support for them will help? Why doesn't she support early learning and childcare? Why doesn't she support the Canada Child Benefit, which has helped to lift more than 2.3 million Canadians, particularly children, out of poverty? Why doesn't she support dental care, which is helping the poorest Canadians be able to take care of their health and their teeth. That is conservative hypocrisy, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Peterborough, Kawartha. After eight years of this Liberal NDP coalition, food has never been more expensive. In fact, food is so unaffordable that 50 active serving military families from CFB Gagetown are using the Oral Mukto Food Bank. This is outrageous, it is shocking, and it is unacceptable. Right. So for the That's hundredth right. time, on behalf of all the Canadians and 70% of the premiers in this country, will they spike the hike, axe the tax, and make food more affordable? Yeah! yeah. The Honourable Minister uh, for National Defence. Oh, Mr. Speaker, that's an extraordinary comment, and I, I'd like to commend the member for being able to say with a straight face. Well, you should have a bag over your head. We're denying access to information requests. The Canadian Armed Forces a very significant raise just last year. And when it came before this House to vote for the money for that raise, every single Conservative on that side of the House oh voted against it. Shame. Mr. Speaker, perhaps they should scrap the crap. Shame. Lousy, lousy cop, lousy police chief, lousy Minister of Open Borders, and a lousy Defence Minister. Ask uh, members to be very judicious in their use of words and to making sure, and that, I'm not asking the Honorable Minister to be very uh, judicious in his choice of words. The Honorable Member. Well, what's he Peter upset about now? Hmm. Mr. Speaker, that's, that's exactly the lack of classy response I would expect from a member. And, and the reality is is he, he doesn't know what's going on because clearly he doesn't listen. These are 50 real families accessing the food bank under that Prime Minister's watch. $700 more in groceries a year for Canadian families. Low-income families are most impacted. A million more users of food banks this year. Students, seniors, low-income families. Those are the facts. That's what we will keep fighting for. Spike the hike, axe the tax. Yeah. The Honourable Minister of National Defence. Mr. Speaker, many people in this House profess to support members of the Canadian Armed Forces, and yet when it came time to put your money where your mouth is, they weren't there. When it came time to vote for a pay raise for members of the well, Canadian Well, they just gave Forces, themselves a pay raise last week. single one of them voted against it. Mr. Speaker, that's the height of hypocrisy. Shame. You can bet they're all going to vote for that. Before I move to the Honourable Member for for Salaberry Sirwa, I would just like to remind all members that when you're answering questions or asking questions, you need to go through the chair. The Honourable Member for Salaberry Sirwa. 
The word out of Ottawa these days is no. No to full powers and immigration oh, for Quebec. But also, they're going to be talking no about this for to months. The right to withdraw with full compensation from the federal dental care program. No to the right to withdraw with full compensation from the federal uh, uh, drugs program. No uh, early requests for medical assistance in dying. And even in healthcare, where Quebec has they, full powers, they the just love no. this euthanasia even program. Created Quebec. by Quebec, it's no. They're always they're, they're always crying Quebec's about expertise getting of complicating or oh. even. Preventing they want more French care. speakers, but they want they seem to want to kill them all. Then I have ministers, they sell the honorable minister of public services Block. and procurement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm so happy to hear our colleague talk about dental care, the new uh, Canadian dental care program, Mr. Speaker, under which uh, 1.4 million seniors have already asked for access, and of that 1.4 million seniors, over a third are seniors from Quebec. And there are more seniors from Quebec who have made a request with success than seniors from Ontario. And all that is because, Mr. Speaker, we really need this plan to help seniors get essential dental care and also to help uh, make sure that our professionals can take care of people across the country, including in Quebec. The Honourable Member for Mocan. When it comes to health care, even when Ottawa and Quebec agree, the federal government threatens to say no. Quebec has resigned itself to the insufficient increase in health transfers, and yet Ottawa is threatening to cut if Quebec doesn't meet its conditions in the next 13 days. Even when Ottawa and Quebec have the same goals and when they agree, Ottawa is threatening to hold back the money if we don't sign to improve uh, to approve each one of its conditions. What is the federal government waiting for to give Quebecers their money back? Do we have to beg on bended knee? No, no, I mean, this the Honourable Minister of Transport. Well, you know, Mr. Speaker, who's saying no, it's the Bloc Québécois. They're saying no to collaboration, no to conversations, no to partnerships, no to everything, Mr. No Speaker. Everything. Meanwhile, the government is working with the government of Quebec to have a fair agreement, and we're very confident that we'll get there by the end of the month, Mr. Speaker. Why? Why? Because it's good for all Quebecers, for everyone except for the Bloc Québécois. Le Honourable Député de Montcalm. The Honourable Member for Montcalm. This government has just decided it's going to say no to everything, no to everything all the time, no to Bill 21, no to full power and immigration, no to Quebec's ability to manage health care itself, even though it's exclusive provincial jurisdiction. Imagine, today, they're saying no to Quebec's autonomy when it comes to managing its own fields of jurisdiction despite the fact that this principle is recognized across Canada. Do the Liberals not realize to what extent they're showing a lack of respect to Quebec? The Honourable Minister of Transport. Does the Bloc Québécois not realize the extent to which it's uh, not showing respect to Quebecers, Mr. Speaker? And, you know, our leader... Uh, uh, their leader, their leader uh, attacked the Premier of Quebec in a speech. Meanwhile, our uh, uh, leader is meeting with the Premier. Th the Bloc are the champions of no, no to agreements, no to discussion, no to collaboration. That's what the Bloc Québécois is. We are going to have an agreement by the end of the month, an agreement that's good for all Quebecers, Mr. Speaker, but not for the Bloc Québécois, apparently. <laughs> The Honourable Member from Costa Bay, Central, got a Notre Dame. Mr. Speaker, Saturday's poll by the voice of the common man revealed that 90% of Newfoundlanders and Labradorians are against the April 1st increase in carbon tax to tw by 23%. Even the Liberal Premier, a fury, he, he pleaded with the Prime Minister to pause the uh, April 1st tax hike. Right. Uh, Newfoundlanders and Labradorians are sick and tired of these cruel April Fool's jokes. So after eight years, will this NDP Liberal Prime Minister heed the plea and spike the hike, or will he once again prove that he's simply not worth the cost? The Honourable Minister for Labour. Mr. Speaker, on this side of the House, we will continue. We are absolutely driven to impart upon the people of Canada cold, hard cash in their pockets. That is what the Canada, that is what this rebate will do. This is not, this is not something that's made up. This is not something that's trivial. This is something that Canadians feel in their bank accounts and in their wallets and in their pockets four times a year. This is real, ca real cash, Mr. Speaker. Oh. We will not deny. And it's real cash, cash we're losing every time we get gas in the pool. 
just a comment here, Louise, Michelle. I do know Odessa, and that's an interesting. I, I'm not aware of the story here, but I'll find out what went on. And the impact of Canadian food production is staggering. A green farmer in Simcoe County paid thirty-six thousand dollars in the carbon tax in one month. The carbon tax cost a poultry farm in Alberta $180,000 last year. The food professor, Dr. Sylvain Charlebois, advised the Liberals to spike the hike or see wholesale food costs go up 34%. Wow. Food production is no joke. Will the Prime Minister spike the hike so farmers can afford to grow food? The Honourable Minister for Agriculture and Agri-Food. This is Vito. I am oh my is God. Well aware that farmers are on the front line of climate change. He's also this, this is Joe aware Biden's other brother. We have a climate change a, a, a environmental plan. He's also aware that his constituents receive one thousand eight hundred dollars a year in their bank account. Is that what you want to cut? One thousand eight hundred dollars out of your constituents' bank account? I disagree. This is just so absurd. Once, this once reasoning again, like is so absurd. Mind, uh, ministers to make sure that their answers go through the chair. I also invite all members to do that. The reason why that's done is so that uh, there is always a, a sense that there is not personal tax when members are uh, asking questions or making responses. The Honourable Member from Foothills. My constituents are fully aware that Liberals are taking away $2,900 and giving them back $1,800. That is not revenue neutral. But here are the facts. The Liberals are increasing the cost of food yet again on April 1st by increasing the carbon tax by 23%. This is driving Canadians to food banks in unprecedented numbers. Mm -hmm. The Caring Cupboard Food Bank in Prince Edward Island is struggling just to keep its doors open. It can't handle the increase in demand of 70%, 5,500 families. I know the Prime Minister is bored, but will he listen to Canadians, ask the tax... So Second Canadians reference to the, the Prime Minister being bored. I don't know why they haven't... The exploded. Maybe they're the waiting until Justin Minister actually Schmitz. gets there. Mr. Speaker, oh, no. it is very surprising to hear the member opposite talk about support condescending for the most vulnerable Canadians. But I'm glad he is turning his attention there. So if he cares about the families of PEI, I want to understand, does he support our early learning and child care system, which PEI has been enthusiastically a part of, which is putting money back in the pockets of PEI families. Does he support that? Does he support dental care that the seniors of PEI are enthusiastically supportive of? That is real support. The Honourable Member from Vancouver East. After two months, I'm aware of nearly 2,000 loved ones in Gaza are still waiting to receive a call from IRCC to reunite with their families in Canada. Clearly, the 1,000 arbitrary cap is a problem. And even for those with codes, not one person has made it to safety, not even people whose biometrics is completed. Meanwhile, families are reporting that their loved ones have been killed in an airstrike. Why can't Canada get people across the border when other countries can? And what will it take for the minister to lift that cap? <laughs> The Honourable Minister for Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, it'll perhaps be cold comfort for the member opposite to find out that we are indeed increasing the number of people that will be eligible to come out of Gaza. There are a number of matters that are beyond our control, notably the ability to extract people from the Rafa Gate. That is something that falls within matters of other governments, which we, we, we plead with them to let those people out. But again, we will be relentless in advocating for people reuni reunifying with their family members in Canada, if but for on a temporary basis. Thank you. Here, here. The Honourable Member from Hamilton Centre. Starvation of civilians during war is absolutely prohibited under Article 54 of the Geneva Conventions. A UN food agency just reported that due to the Israeli siege on Reza, 1.1 million Palestinians are facing catastrophic hunger. And the EU foreign policy chief, Joseph Burrell, stated that Israel is provoking famine in Reza and using starvation as a weapon of war. So my question is, did the foreign affairs minister at any point during her high-level meetings with the two Israeli cabinet ministers named in the ICJ proceedings raised the plight of starving Palestinians in Gaza forced into famine by Israel. The Honourable Minister for Foreign Affairs. Yes, Mr. Speaker, I did. 
And you know what? I will never shy away from having difficult conversations, maybe with the Israeli government, maybe with the Palestinian Authority. And we need to make sure that we will continue. You couldn't have an intelligent conversation with anybody. Who is a terrorist Melanie? organization to release hostages? We support the discussions that are happening with Qatar, Egypt, the U.S. to make sure, and of course Israel, to make sure that the hostages are released. And we need to make sure that there's more humanitarian access to Gaza, including the support of UNRWA. Thank you so much. Does she ever get around to actually the stating what the government's policy is? No. Mr. Not, Speaker, not even in close. recent months, we've heard lots of stories about Canadians with disabilities receiving oh. unacceptable treatment. Don't, don't you hate Canadian it when they airlines. read it from their little Canadians with green binder, the which they were handed before they got there? They deserve equal access and to be treated oh, that's with dignity. Just pathetic. The Minister of Transport said it best when he said, our airlines oh, need he said to it do best. a better job for Canadians. So can he tell us what's happening next? The Honourable Minister of Transport. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank my colleague for his amazing work. And, and I've been clear, what happened was completely unacceptable. All Canadians must be treated with dignity and respect, full stop. Yeah, Pablo and did get a haircut over the we break. We have to do better. And the Minister of Diversity, Inclusion and Persons with Disabilities Act like, wants like, uh, to see action He belongs now, in the House of Commons. Which is why I'm announcing an air accessibility he doesn't, summit but at in least he looks that on way. May 9th. We have to work together to ensure a more accessible, a more inclusive Canada. This is about fairness, dignity, and respect. No, no, I... The Honourable Member for Megantique L'Erable. That's Kenny Rogers. After eight years of this That's Liberal good. government, <laughs> Quebec farmers are feeling the pinch. Tax hikes, inflation, and carbon pricing, which the Bloc uh, would like to radically increase, have led to a general feeling of frustration according to the president of the Union des Pro yeah. Producteurs I gotta Agricoles. Put that one up. He says with the rise in interest rates plus in the increase reference in to import costs, Pablo Rodriguez is fine, new haircut. Coming, and we're talking about virtually zero Gospel net income in 2024. Right. Hey, it's Kenny well, Rogers. Liberal yeah. and Bloc MPs <laughs> listens, listen to the farmers' frustration and votes I don't against think he the 23 percent carbon tax hike on April 1st. He tells a good story, the but I don't Prime think he can Minister sing. and Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, I hope that the member across the way understands that Quebec, okay, won't the him, province of worry. Quebec, has its own carbon price system. This system was established in 2013. There she goes. There's Christie's Quebec's going again with her pumping, pumping the arms. And, and I think Quebecers have the right to know. Just so superior. If the Conservative Party and the member across the way, intend to demolish Quebec's system. Wouldn't everybody uh, want to be a dumpy the finance minister? The Honourable Member from Mégantic uh, In the lower St. Lawrence region, 500 it's like farmers, her job. Uh, escorted it by two tractors. Oh, yeah, she does that uh, very well. If that's her job, North she's Shore succeeding. In City, it's a real cry from the heart that our farmers are launching across the province. While farmer farm closures multiply, the Liberals, supported by the Bloc, think it's a good idea to raise taxes on diesel, Mr. Speaker. The Bloc Liberal Coalition uh, All the has increased you're from Vancouver the Island. taxes for those who produce food uh, so that Quebecers I am from Vancouver Island. Well, can they yes, give up these taxes Nicole so Mox. Quebecers can continue to eat Proud locally? The Honourable <laughs> Deputy Prime Minister, <laughs> Mr. Speaker. But my province has gone insane, the though. The Premier right. of Quebec was Mr. Legault and not the member across the way. And it's Quebec that has its own system for carbon pricing. This system is working very well. This system has the support of Quebecers and the province supports it. We do respect Quebec's jurisdiction and that of the system it's established. <laughs> The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Mr. Speaker, after eight years of this Liberal government, Canadians know that this government likes to meddle in provincial, provincial jurisdiction. Now meddle. the latest attack is on woodland caribou. We support the 1,600 workers in this sector, but now this Liberal mm. Environment Minister wants to meddle in areas that are not his business. This question is for the Deputy Prime the worst thing they do is meddle in education with gender ideology, and they meddle in health with euthanasia.
That's the worst thing the, the Liberals meant. Uh, the oh, here, here is the moron. Climate change. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to remind my honorable colleague that more than a year ago, the Quebec government and the federal government signed. We haven't seen half which stand up for quite a while. Under which we commit to protecting 70% of the caribou's habitat. And this agreement also set out consultations with the this indigenous peoples on this so plan. The Quebec stupid. government committed to do this, and we expect the Quebec government to respect their word. Thank you, to keep their word. The Honourable Member yeah, for get Charles the translation right. Charles, Mr. Speaker, the uh, Former Judge DeLille was convicted of premeditated murder of his wife in 2012. The decision was upheld on appeal and at the Supreme Court in 2021. Uh, David Lemeny intervened to request another trial, saying he was convinced that there had been a miscarriage of justice. But the report from the review group unveiled Thursday that there is no miscarriage of justice. It uh, is the government denouncing the preferential treatment given to the former Judge DeLille by the former Minister of Justice, David Lametti? I'd like to thank the minister, uh, the member rather, for his question. What I'd like to stress is that we're aware of the situation and we are going to follow up on this. Thank you. The Honourable Member for ah, Saint-Jean. So you're suggesting Trudeau is going, Quebec going sets to its own immigration targets. Doesn't they want say, a vote on the Israel Palestinian vote? It's even more. <laughs> You don't think so. Two weeks ago, that the minister ordered his officials to exceed yeah, that's this a no win situation for, for Quebec. It's for a serious Trudeau, precedent. What's he told the rest of the party to do? The rest of the, the, uh, rest of the not as a liberal decision, caucus. But as a suggestion. It's the imposition on Quebec of federal immigration policies inspired by the Century Initiative in direct affront of the spirit of the Canada-Quebec Accord. Will the minister back down and return to discussions with Quebec? No, no, the Honourable Minister of Immigration and Refugees. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm ready to answer the question when the member did read the, if she you can reassure me that she did read the accord, the honorable member. I'll be pleased to say that I did do so. But the federal government has absolutely no lessons to give Quebec in terms of successful immigration. It's the federal government that has plunged immigrate immigrants into the worst housing crisis in recent years, and it's responsible for the service breakdowns for asylum seekers. It's the minister's fault that these people don't have the right to work to meet their basic needs. So no, we're not going to accept him unilaterally increasing immigration targets chosen by Quebec. Once again, will the minister respect, respect Quebec's choices? Uh, I mean, the Honourable Minister of Immigration Mr. Speaker, I have a question to ask the member across the way. Clearly, the I'm just going to silence him for a sec here. Quebec families who are we know Mark Miller says the same thing every time he stands ones. up. Clearly, this vote on Israel and Palestine, if they recognize Palestine, a two-state solution, it's a no-win situation for the liberals. So I don't, I don't know what they're going to do. It's going to be interesting. Well, first, after eight years of this NDP liberal government, Middle-income families are depending on food banks. They receive absolutely nothing, no federal tax rebate, no provincial tax credit. But they do get higher prices for food, <laughs> gas, and heating. Seven of 10 premiers are demanding the prime minister spike the hike, but the NDP premier of BC is cheering it on. Will the prime minister stop the suffering and authorize Premier Eby to spike the hike on April 1st? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister, Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, as with the Conservative Quebec MPs, we are hearing a question that demonstrates either profound ignorance or profound disrespect. Well, we all can't be as sagacious as you, Christia. We all can't have grandfathers who were Nazi propaganda. We all couldn't be failures as journalists as you were. Led by a center right provincial government put in place a world-leading price on pollution. That system is popular. That system was voted for by some current conservative oh, federal MPs oh, from BC. Mm. Do they want to tear Where it is Trudeau? The honorable member from South Sorry, Sandy, he's anywhere of a question. Mr. Speaker, we absolutely do, because that was a baloney answer from this man. Uh -oh. Minister, and that's what we're getting from the BC Premier as well. Well, we're having some. 
there's 200,000 British Columbians relying on food banks in a single month now. The tax credit shell game, if you qualify, We're having is rolling less internet than you pay. BC already has the highest tax <laughs> gas prices. Two dollars more than in Trudeau's online harms country. A 23 percent hike will force up prices another 18 cents a liter. This prime minister isn't worth the cost. Will he show some compassion and authorize the BC premier to spike the hike on April 1st? The Honorable Deputy Prime Minister. Hey, the BC Premier uh, loves the yes. carbon Mr. tax. Speaker, Can't get enough of it. The MP from BC. Oh, just painful. I have to answer your question. Of BC of putting forward baloney policies for the people of BC. Hey, if Paul Yip said they can't afford baloney. to step on the jurisdiction of the province of BC uh, yeah. is it intended to go against a system put in place in 2008 by a center-right BC provincial government that the people of BC support? That is astonishing, Mr. Speaker. It's astonishing that you can stand up in the House of Commons without a bag on your head. Mr. Speaker, after eight years of this NDP Liberal government, more and more British Columbians are lining up at food banks. That's not baloney. The fact that many can't afford to drive with a buck ninety-nine a liter gas isn't baloney either. What's also not baloney is on page 75 of the BC's 2024 budget, where the provincial government blames this prime minister for forcing a 23% carbon tax hike on mm. April 1st. Will the Prime Minister help sandwich British Columbians and spike the hike? Or do British Columbians need to throw him out like an old, spoiled, stale pack of baloney? BC hey. is the poorest of all the provinces because of the carbon tax. It is impoverished because of environmental ideology, activism, and insanity. Mr. Speaker, let's just remember that every single one of the Conservative MPs in this House today ran on a platform promising a price uh, on pollution. No, let's and start talking about it again. The DC caucus of He's gone. He's history. MPs and so will you very shortly. You'll be history too. Voted for British Columbia's current world leading price on pollution. So Canadians and the people of BC have to ask themselves, do they even know what they campaigned on and what they voted for? You know how annoying you are and why anybody voted for you? Mr. Speaker, I would like to wish you and every member of parliament a happy Francophonie month. Mr. Oh, Speaker, you're kidding. In the last budget, another month, our government announced its action plan well, my God, I, I didn't realize it was Francophonie Month. Include a historic four point. What have I been doing with myself? To help official language minority communities oh. across Canada, including Acadia and what New a, Brunswick. Could the Minister of Official Languages tell what us a about gender recent politics measures announced bunch of for the Francophonie Month? The Honourable Minister. Oh, I'm glad somebody finally languages. raised this. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank my honourable oh. colleague for his tireless work on behalf of Acadians and the Canadian Francophonie. Our government and here's is the, making record. Here's the skinhead who's constantly saying he's, he's feels the pain. Last week, all we of these kids who won't uh, be able to get mutilated anymore. Million they can't get a sex change. It's all of an Alberta. More than 300 so organizations across the country. And with these investments, we're ensuring strong, Randy's vibrant, the man and with diverse big communities. Heart. I'd like to join my colleague on the phone all night and everyone with here in this house. Apparently. A happy Francophonie month. The Honourable Member from Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands and Rita Lakes. This NDP Liberal government has been trying to cover up the full cost of their $60 million arrive scam. And after eight years of this Prime Minister yes, and his get NDP back to something Liberal important. government, they're not worth the cost or the corruption. Not the caribou in Quebec. The documents and we've been hearing the paper shredders, but his homework is due today. So the question is to the Prime Minister, at what time will he respect the common sense conservative motion that was passed a, by the this questions House today are pathetic. All of the documents, and the answers and the are pathetic, but the questions are pathetic too. I gotta scandal. make that comment here because the first question that arrived, Sam, it's all the question here is almost over. Nothing about the Chinese spying, nothing about political interference in the election, nothing about Trudeau being bored with the job. They two comments about it, no questions. And no, this really is, really is 
unacceptable. Servants to be efficient and acting quickly. Unfortunately, some of the some of the rules were not followed, and there's more work to do. Although much of the work that the Auditor General asked us to do has already been implemented. The Honourable Member from Leeds Grenville, Thousand Island, Rita Lakes. The Auditor General asked in terms of information this government didn't even want to provide. That's why they voted against having the Auditor General investigate this Prime Minister's $60 million arrive scam. It's clear that after eight years of this NDP Liberal government that they're not worth the, worth the corruption or worth the cost. That $60 million, Speaker, was for outside consultants. It wasn't for public servants who needed to act quickly. It was for Ottawa insiders who were getting rich, being made millionaires while Canadians struggle and are now lined up at food banks. This Prime Minister's had weeks. He won't stand up, but we're, we've ordered him to provide the documents. At what time will they be provided? The Honourable Minister for Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, from the very beginning, our government has been transparent with Canadians and with Parliament. We've had officials, we've had ministers appear before parliamentary committees. We understand the concern that Canadians have around the appropriate use of taxpayers' money. And Mr. Speaker, mm. in spite of my friend's pessimism, I don't share his view. No. This government no. will like Dominic's had another hard weekend. To transparent with Canadians oh, around this matter. Here, here. The Honourable Member from Fort Saskatchewan, Sherwood Park. Sorry, Sherwood Park. After eight years, the Arrive Scam scandal has made clear again that this NDP Liberal government and this Prime Minister are not worth the cost or the corruption. Right. Liberals gave GC Strategies $20 million for Arrive Scam alone. Now, last week, Christian Firth from GC Strategies revealed that he got at least $2,600 per hour wow. for subcontracting. Wow. Canadians are struggling to put food on the table and Liberals are giving well-connected consultants multi-millions at $2,600 per hour. Unbelievable. Simple question. Do Liberals believe that $2,600 per hour was a reasonable rate? Was it reasonable? The Honourable Minister for Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, as my colleague knows very well, there are internal investigations being conducted into all these matters. We welcome the report of the Auditor General. The RCMP is investigating some elements of this matter. And Mr. Speaker, if at any time people have misused taxpayers' money or contractors have claimed uh, taxpayers' money for work they didn't uh, complete, of course the government will demand refunds as is appropriate. Of course. There's no the of course. From Cloverdale, Langley. I don't know why we're getting a bad connection today. City. Mr. Oh. Speaker, earlier this month, legislation was... was introduced in the other place, which that affirms the Government of Canada's recognition of the Haida Nation as the holder of inherent rights of governance and self-determination. Mm. These types of bills... are needed as we move forward on the path of reconciliation with Indigenous communities. Can the Minister... Oh, what a stupid... We're getting interference. Aren't you? ...of Crown Indigenous relations tell us what this means for the Haida Nation. You know, my apologies for the bad internet connection here. I don't know what's going on. Located on the Haida Gwaii Archipelago off British Columbia's north coast. The Honourable Minister for Crown Indigenous Relations. Mr. Speaker, this marks a historical milestone for the Haida Nation. It is 50 years in the making and it would rightfully recognize the Council of the Haida Nation as the government of the Haida people. This long overdue step solidifies Haida's authority, ensuring the protection of the beautiful lands and waters of Haida Gwaii. For... <sighs> generations to come. I'm grateful to the nation for their collaboration. 
Corporation and the member from Cloverdale Langley City for this question as well as his leadership on the I-9 committee. We will keep working to uphold the rights of the Haida Nation, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The Honorable Member from Nanaimo, Lady Smith. Mr. Speaker, for five months, the Liberals have sat idly by while 30,000 uh. civilians in Palestine. What? Anyway, menacing muskrat. What are you? What are you talking about? King Charlie kicked the bug. I've been killed. Most of which have I haven't been looked women at the news in an hour. So. It's <laughs> devastating. Ah, oh, sorry about this. This is. Because you're getting my reception, but Canada we're not getting a stand. We're not getting the CPAC reception. I don't know why. For peace, so that no one else is killed, not sitting on the sidelines. We need a ceasefire, real humanitarian aid, and the. Well, I don't. Well, thank you for your understanding here. Just the usual high quality of the internet in this country. Release of all hostages. Will the liberals finally? Good time to good time to be talking over them anyway, but. You see, last week, Justin says he doesn't need to be popular. He so doesn't care Canada if he's popular. New Democrats that's because he wants to be a dictator. And that's and he doesn't care if he has to govern as an unpopular dictator. And I predict that's where he's going. Our motion for peace and justice. The Honourable <laughs> Minister for Foreign Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to thank my colleague for her important question. Indeed, we believe... In well, peace and stability the end, yeah. in the region and it starts with the release of all hostages we need to make sure that humanitarian aid gets into gaza and of course we need to get to a humanitarian ceasefire which will bring long and lasting peace to israel and also support a two-state solution. And yeah, well, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna switch now at this point, but I think I will try Pearl. Creation of a Palestinian state. Pearl view tomorrow, because this long, is ridiculous. Israelis and Palestinians have suffered for the fact that we have been find, found a solution. Well, thank you for passing conflict. on that news. I can't. We need to be there to support them. And and we will be. My God, that is shocking. The Honourable Member Member for Richmond, Arthabasca. I'm just going to check and uh, see if that's accurate. Mr. Speaker, since the yes, I just confirmed that report here too. That's I. I am absolutely shocked. I had everyone was saying he was King Charles the third is dead. No, liberal government was elected in 2015. Liberal government Russian was elected in 2015. We've been treated. Okay. No, he's not dead. 
<laughs> this is apparently a Buckingham Palace denies King Charles III. This is apparently that. not true from second evaluation here. Russian Bucking? media falsely claimed King Charles There were reports he was dead. The Buckingham Palace is saying he's not dead. So I'm going to have look into this further. But anyway, thanks for... <laughs> anyway, I, I cannot believe this reception at this point. This is... Uh... Seventeen minutes book. They claim is spread by Russian media. Yeah, it's a. He has cancer, though. Anyway, yeah, no, he's King Charles the Third is not dead. It goes to show you, though, when you're there's nothing of interest in question period, he will be Deal looking year. at. Oh, the country's debt has been exploding, and it's pretty pathetic in Canada. Oh, I can't stand watching this anymore. And anyway, since then, I'm gonna, more, more people are worried. I'm going to cut this short the, with the. The cost of living is steadily rising. With Russian the period, which has got about two minutes left. Anyway. Comes out of control. And but this is we really, really pathetic. Financial. Anyway, thanks for watching today, folks. Uh, there was probably about two minutes left of question period, but this is getting silly watching it this way. Thanks for, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. And keep keep watching this week in terms of whether or not the conservatives can actually get on to some kind of message that's coherent instead of I don't even know what they were talking about today. About the caribou in Quebec, that's that is their that's the topic of concern. After all that's happened. They go away for two weeks and it's like, it doesn't matter anymore. It doesn't, there's no, they don't want to talk about a rive scam. They don't want to talk about Chinese spies sending back pathogens and it documents to China. They don't want to talk about Chinese interference in our elections. They want to talk about the caribou in Quebec. And it, it just amazes me. And of course, nothing about this resolution, about this NDP resolution. We know Justin Trudeau is a coward, but we need to have better questions from the official opposition. And I'm not here to carry water for anybody. So if I'm not satisfied with the questions we're getting, all we're hearing is slogans of not worth the cost, not worth the cost. Not it's It is not good enough. That's not worth the cost either. We need to go after this liberal government every day, vociferously, as hard as possible, and to keep on these issues. The Online Harm Act, they haven't talked about that once in the House of Commons. Well, actually, once they did. But come back from two weeks vacation, and they're only going to be here a week. So if they don't get some blows in this week, what's going to happen? And you know, it goes very quickly from now until the end of the session when they take off in June. And they've got lots of weeks off here in April and May. So this is really, really disappointing. So I want to leave it on that note because uh, we all know the liberals and can't answer questions. We all know the liberals don't want to answer questions. They want to obfuscate. They want to avoid at, at all cost. But we need better questions too. And we need to stay on this liberal government. So Justin's not there today. He's rarely ever there. He's there once a week on average, maybe twice if we're lucky. But this, we cannot let Justin Trudeau's presence in the House of Commons affect the tenor of the questions and the, the interrogation that must go on. So I'll leave it at that today. Thanks for watching, folks. I will be back tomorrow. And I'm going to try Parle View tomorrow because I'm sick to death of CPAC and this horrible reception today. It's no fair for you. It's not no fair for me. So thanks for uh, thanks for watching. And uh, please catch my broadcast. I'm not sure if I'm doing another one today. But I did two over the last couple of days. Please have a look at them if you can. Subscribe to the station. Like the broadcast.
We're almost at 20,000 viewers. And, you know, I tell you, when I left the Western Standard, when I started doing a weekly broadcast there, we had about 20,000 subscribers at that media outlet. And I started with zero. And in, the, in about a year, I'm up to 20,000. And the Western Standard is about the same now. But I'm sort of, I feel like I've caught up as an independent journalist doing this. Uh, and it's it's only because people like you are watching and care enough about these issues. And I try to give you quality and I try to give you truth, not clickbait and not crap. Because it's easy to say every day that Justin Trudeau is resigning or he's finished or it's over and it's he's going to jail, but it's all lies and it's not happening. Justin Trudeau will cling tenaciously to power until we get rid of him. I don't mean that in terms of forcibly, but in terms of a non-confidence vote or getting him out of office through a free election. But that's what has to happen. Anyway, thanks for watching today, folks. I love you all.